Carol. They're going to give a brief presentation on the main, the highlights from the report. They're not going to be able to go into a lot of detail because we don't have time. But during the question and answer session, you can certainly pose uh, questions that may draw out some of those issues. And of course, we refer you to, to the report for further information. And after they speak, uh, we're going to show a short film. Nita. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. So we'll dry, uh, dive straight into the presentation. So what is communication with crisis-affected communities? It's communication for crisis-affected communities, not about them. So it's not about public relations or situation reports or hum you know, humanitarian news for the outside world. It's not top-down information provision to crisis-affected communities. It's about a genuine dialogue with crisis-affected communities. How is the presentation structured? Uh, we will focus on the drivers of change, uh, the preparedness tools that InfoSA developed, the learning from the pilot projects, and our overall findings and conclusions. The three key drivers were the proliferation of the quality and accountability initiatives, uh, the changing role of media development organizations, and the ICT revolution. Uh, more about this from Mark Harvey later, and um, some key facts and figures in, in, the, in the paper itself. Um, so. Here we have a few key landmarks. Uh, there were a number of publications, discussions, and initiatives um, that, that really pushed this agenda forward. Um, Info as Aid was one of those initiatives, operated by BBC Media Action and Internews, two media development organizations, and funded by the UK Department for International Development. Um, the project had two key objectives. The first was to strengthen the capacity and preparedness of partner aid agencies uh, to deliver communications in emergencies. And the second was to actually integrate communications with affected communities in uh, pilot projects. So uh, how did the development of the preparedness tools come about? Uh, both media development organizations, BBC Media Action and Internews, pretty early on identified three key gaps or, or challenges. One, inadequate information pr provision to crisis-affected communities. Uh, two, um, there was a lack of a comprehensive, up-to-date, and freely available resource that provided a comprehensive baseline on the media and telecommunications uh, landscape or environment in crisis-prone countries. And three, it was, it was perceived and, and also felt by aid agencies that there was a lack of understanding, knowledge, and capacity within aid agencies um, or the staff of aid agencies to really meaningfully uh, meaningfully engage with crisis-affected communities and in, and in ways that were new and in innovative, really harnessing the potential of this ICT revolution. So what were the solutions? Oh. Yeah. So the three, the three solutions um, that the Info Aid project came up with were the development of a message library. There are over 300 messages in the library. Um, and the idea here is that aid agencies can now deliver information in a really speedy fashion, um, in a coherent manner, with the potential to uh, foster cross-cluster collaboration um, with regards to information provision. Uh, the media and telecoms landscape guides help facilitate preparedness work around communication. Um, with affected communities, and they also form the basis of information needs and access assessments post-disaster. Uh, the e-learning course uh, is an interactive scenario-based course that emphasizes information provision, dialogue, feedback, and the reorientation of programs based on feedback. 
so what were some of the, the lessons that we learned from developing these tools? Um, first of all, um, we were trying to affect change um, from the outside. For uh, two media development organizations and, uh, and you know, a project run by these two media development organizations that were non-traditional humanitarian actors, without a mandate, affecting change from the outside was incredibly challenging. Um, second, second challenge, um, oh sorry, and the way we overcame this was, was really through persistence, building trust, um, identifying champions within agencies and then working with them throughout the innovation process. Um, the second lesson we learned was that given that all of our tools were software applications, it was really necessary to, to follow a process of agile software development, really taking into consideration user, user feedback, user testing, and adapting the tools um, based on the feedback that we receive from users throughout the innovation process. And this cannot be underestimated in terms of the time and human resources really required uh, to do this. Um, the, the third mm -hmm. lesson we learned was and I think this is a common challenge across the board, sustainability. When a project ends, what happens to its outputs? Ideally, the innovation process is you know, a multi-stage process from recognizing a problem to actually designing a solution to developing the actual tool, product, service, to implementing it in the field, to refining it, to diffusing it more widely. In the case of InfoZaid, we got to the stage of developing the tools and implementing them partially, <coughs> but that was where the project ended. And that sustainability is always a big question mark. And in this case, uh, you know, I would say that uh, the tools haven't really been sustained. Okay, Anita talked about the uh, preparedness tools, and I'm going to talk about the pilot projects. When InfoSAID was um, initially drafted in 2009, there was a sense that humanitarian organizations were interested in the concept of communicating with disaster-affected populations with new ICT tools, but there was little guidance about how to go about doing it, and moreover, there was very little evidence as to whether or not this would actually improve the quality of humanitarian aid. So the objectives of the pilot projects were first to support aid, aid agencies, in piloting innovative projects and to assess their impact. <coughs> Info is Aid partnered with four organizations, conducted five pilot projects in two countries, Kenya and Somalia. The reason we ended up in these two countries is because in 2001, the main humanitarian emergency, or one of the main ones, was the drought in the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. And the other reason is that the organizations we partnered with wanted to test the approaches yeah. and the relationship with us in a protracted crisis before going out into an emergency environment. Hence, that's why we ended up in these areas. The learning reviews that we did were focused on Kenya due to time and security constraints. We couldn't do any in Somalia, and hence I'm going to just focus this presentation on what we learned from Kenya. And you look at the, um, the table, you see that we were in the arid and semi-arid lands in Kenya with World Vision and Action Aid and Save the Children, and that two of the programs were primarily focused on recovery and relief from the drought. Each organization had specific objectives they wanted to um, reach, but there were common communication challenges across the three pilots. The first one was that these organizations were using slow, labor-intensive communication, usually face-to-face -face meetings, and this was hampered by security and access issues. There was a lack of systematic and timely channel to relay urgent information from the organization to the communities and the other way around also. There was a feeling within the organization that the existing mechanisms for soliciting feedback were underutilized, so there was a desire to try new things. There was limited engagement with the communities, and by this I mean a lot of the communication that took place was usually about um, extracting information regarding project outputs rather than discussing concerns or priorities of the community. And finally, there was a general lack of access of information among aid recipients, and this was particularly pronounced among women. 
The proposed solutions. Info is aid uh, develop customized uh, communication strategy with each organization. But as time went on, we realized that there was a model that was emerging. And this model was based on two things. First of all, the fact that we were operating in very similar environments. And second of all, the fact that these were small scale pilots. So there were certain technologies that we could look at. For example, frontline SMS was very effective for what we were looking at. If we had much bigger populations we were serving, we would have perhaps seen other technologies. The channels that we used were mobiles coupled with solar panels, solar uh, chargers, frontline SMS hub, and IVR. And whenever possible, we encourage the use of community radio stations. Community radio stations go to the second part of the model, which is a mass communications channel to disseminate information to and receive information from affected communities, whether or not they are aid recipients of that organization. Okay, so you're going to see a video where this might be a little more self-explanatory, but I had to at least try to explain it a little bit with a graph. When we would arrive somewhere, typically the communication flow would go from the regional headquarter of the organization to field monitors. And then the field monitors would have to relay that information to relief committee members. And they would do this <coughs> using four by fours or motorbikes. And this could take several days because they had many relief committee members to discuss with. By the time the information was relayed, it was sometimes too late. So in terms of food distribution, there were days where the food trucks would arrive and nobody in the community knew about it, or the food trucks were delayed and communities would wait for days. So what we would do is provide the relief committees with mobile phone solar chargers, put up a frontline SMS hub at the regional headquarters, which enables you to send bulk SMS messages to the field monitors and the relief committees, any other kind of information, and then a community radio station when possible. We're going to continue. We're going to do the video now. We're going to do it at the end. I think we can. Yeah? Okay, great. In emergencies, the emphasis is on saving lives and delivering relief assistance as quickly as possible. <coughs> communication with crisis-affected communities is often limited, but good communication helps aid agencies achieve their program objectives more effectively and gives crisis-affected communities an opportunity to influence and engage with the relief and recovery effort. In 2011, in response to the drought in the Horn of Africa, InfoS Aid ran innovative pilots in Kenya with ActionAid, World Vision, and Save the Children to improve two-way communications between the agencies and the communities they serve. The Wajir program of Save the Children covers a very wide area, very vast land that is arid with no infrastructure in terms of road or facilities. It's an area that you'll find you'll be traveling hundreds of miles without reaching the next village. So what the project now did is making sure that key information holders or gatekeepers that the agency deals with, such as uh, community health workers, the relief committees, water users associations, are empowered by giving out mobile phone with a solar charger. <laughs> ولكن <تصفيق> Mobile phones have played an equally important role in World Vision's programs too. There has been really a pronounced change in the way we communicate and receive information back and forth from our communities and us to the communities. 
mostly it has helped out in terms of mobilizing the communities for various activities that we are set out to do in the field and also as a community response mechanism to enhance accountability in that a lot of complaints are also channeled and real-time information is communicated back unto them and satisfaction is attained both on our side and mostly on their side. Improved communication has not only empowered communities but has also improved program efficiency for the agencies. It has really changed paramount. It has really had a uh, very big impact on our program. For example, in the health sector and nutrition sector, we had uh, 20 health facilities plus 28 outreach sites, 48 sites, and all of them were given forms. In this way, they were to communicate where the shortages of surplus, shortages of drugs, referral cases. They were just communicating, unlike before, they were waiting for a means, okay, whereby that, that, that center, a vehicle passes once in a week or once in after two weeks. They were just communicating after maybe life has been caused, death has occurred. Before, for us to communicate to them, we have to send a vehicle to each and every site to tell them what is happening currently, or if there's any communication from the headquarters. But the frontline SMS, you only want one pattern, everybody gets the message. So that somehow even reduced the cost of operations. Frontline SMS is free open source software that turns a computer into an information hub. It enables you to send out bulk SMS messages to defined contact groups. Recipients can also send messages to the Frontline SMS hub, which can be acted on or forwarded onto the relevant person. One of the objectives of Save the Children's Health and Nutrition program was to reduce maternal and infant mortality. Save the Children sponsored a weekly interactive discussion program on the popular local radio station, Wajir Community Radio. This helped to raise awareness on important issues facing the community and provided a platform for interaction and discussion. At the same time, recordable radio sets were distributed to pre-existing the radio show also helped to reinforce messages promoted by community health workers on safe motherhood and child health. World Vision also sponsored a call-in show on the local radio station Anguo FM. Expert guest speakers raised awareness not only about health and nutrition issues, but also about improved farming techniques to help communities withstand the effects of drought. The programs provided information on diversifying livelihoods through activities such as poultry rearing, hay preservation, and the planting of drought-resistant crops. The vast majority of communities affected by drought are pastoralists. Knowing the local market prices can help them make more informed decisions about where, when, and for how much to sell their livestock. This critical information can in turn help boost household incomes in times of stress. ActionAid used frontline SMS to inform relief committee members and food monitors about current prices. The information was then transcribed and posted as bulletins on notice boards in the local community. Two-way communication gives you quick feedback. 
be it in a radio or a mobile voice call or texting involving the community what do they think of something you just implemented what matters most to them this is about building relationships opening yourself for scrutiny when you open yourself for scrutiny people can understand the challenges you have even funding gaps and all these things uh, or could be you don't have, be able to reach this village in time people understand you very well so now two-way communications allows you, allows you to do that having better relationship better response efficient programming it's really a big thing it's an important issue Great. Right up. Now, Carol, you want to continue? I don't know if we have to switch back over to the presentation. And uh, Yusuf, who you saw on the film, uh, we hope we're going to be connecting with him in a few minutes as well. Yeah, he just sent us a text saying he's changing offices in Nairobi. <laughs> 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 We've got the communication going on here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so a few months, and six to nine months after a pilot project was implemented, we then wanted to go and assess the project. And we wanted to look at the implementation and also at the results. In terms of implementation, the questions that we asked were what was planned, what actually happened, and why. And in terms of the results, the two guiding mm -hmm. questions were, did the pilot project improve affected communities' access to information as well as dialogue with the aid organization? And if that and if that's an affirmative, did that actually have an impact in any way improve the quality of humanitarian aid that was offered? The problem that we found is that there was no developed framework that we could um, use to do this. So we developed our own framework looking at the OECD criteria. We chose five criteria which we felt were the most relevant to communications and the looking at uh, assessing their impact on the overall aid. We looked at re relevant coverage, effectiveness, efficiency, and impact, which I'll go into detail now. We wanted to explore the perspectives of staff within the organization, of community members, of focal points, and of other stakeholders in the project, such as staff within the community radio stations. We had all sorts of perspectives. And we used qualitative research instruments, mostly focus groups and in-depth interviews. So what were the results? In terms of relevance, the mm -hmm. community members felt that the information provided was highly relevant to their information needs. We had done information needs assessments prior to the, um, to prior, prior to the pilot projects, and in some cases they were extremely successful. For example, um, World Vision used the findings from that research to develop a weekly interactive um, radio show, which, as you saw, catered to some of the needs of the population um, in the sh in, um, in Voy specifically, water harvesting, uh, poultry, other forms of income generation. The um, listeners praised the interactive feature of radio call-in shows. They like being able to ask questions, get their um, points of view across, share their experience. The weekly market price information was highly valued, and we came across several examples in Isiolo where market arbitrage was taking place with this information. And in the end, the organizations told us that the interaction with drought-affected communities improved their understanding of the community's needs and priorities, and in some cases, led them to make changes in their systems. And this is detailed in the report. In terms of coverage, there was unequivocal recognition that the radio program, more so than the mobiles, reached a large, larger section of the population that was possible through community mobilizers, and that in some cases, it also reached non-beneficiaries. What was interesting is that the two radio programs by World Vision and Save the Children were, were developed with women in mind, and yet we realized that it was very difficult to reach women. And again, we'll explain this in the report. In terms of efficiency, the principal expectation of this project was that there would be large savings in terms of times and transport, since field monitors no longer had to travel to the field to relay non-complicated, routine type of information, such as mobilization of meetings. Um, testimonies from the field officers of the aid agencies suggest that this did happen and that they became much more productive because they could do several things at once with the telephone and also being at the site. 
but there was a lack of systematic monitoring or data analysis from all three partner organizations, which made it impossible for us to assess this criteria. Effectiveness, this was perhaps one of the more um, most interesting criteria. The, project, the projects increased the speed and frequency of information dissemination and also of dialogue between the aid organizations and the communities. And this noticeably improved food distributions in the two locations, in Isiolo and Wajir, especially the mobile phones and the frontline SMS hubs, before food trucks could spend a day in an area before being able to deliver because the community simply didn't know they were coming, and hence they weren't prepared. The radio programs in VOI supported the increased community, the, sorry, supported the goal of increasing community resilience to the adverse effects of droughts on local livelihoods. And in Wajir, all the stakeholders felt that the mobile phones and the radio program supported all of their programs, but especially the one that was focused on reducing um, mortality rates for women and children under the age of five. And this was due to a referral system of ambulance, which is also detailed in the report. The problem with the uh, OEC DEC criteria, as we had um, looked at them, the first four, is that they didn't really take into account an important impact of these communication projects, which was about human relations. And so we put this under the impact basket. The community members became more active consumers of aid rather than passive recipients. They were able to make more informed decisions in some cases because they had information. We were surprised that in all three projects, the working relationships among the stakeholders markedly improved. The focal points now had a tool that could make them effective liaisons between the community and the organization. They were regarded with increased status in their communities, and the fact that they could communicate regularly about problems and get problems resolved quickly meant that everyone was less <laughs> frustrated in general. And then for the isolated communities, the communication tools serve as a lifeline to the outside world, and this was extremely um, poignant in Wajir and Isiolo where security concerns um, were such that people felt that the mobile phones were incredibly important in getting in enabling them to find out if their family and friends were safe. And this, the psychosocial impact cannot be underestimated. What we learned about implementation very quickly, undertake detailed audience profiles. You need to know the needs of your audience, but also their capacities. In some cases, frontline SMS forms worked well, in others they didn't because we perhaps targeted the wrong people. <coughs> know the user preferences and habits of your audience. IVR system in Isiolo um, had some challenges. Raise the awareness market for service. Don't expect that it's just gonna take off on its own. Ensure there's a system in place to verify, analyze, and respond, react <laughs> to feedback. This was especially well done in Wajir and in Voi. And ensure some technical expertise in-house but also define service agreements with equipment pro providers because you will have technical problems. Yay, last slide. So um, one of the main findings of this report is that communication, well, based on the experience of Info is Aid, that communication with crisis affected communities can significantly improve the quality of humanitarian assistance. What is required to do this at an institution le institutional level? A number of things. Uh, financial resources, of course. So um, mm -hmm. ensure that budgets um, at the outset and project proposals build communication with affected communities in. Um, second, dedicated uh, focal points. Um, as you will see in the report, the success of many of these pilots was linked to the fact that there were dedicated human resources in place. But um, communication is cross-sectoral, and it serves programs. So having just a dedicated communications person in place is not enough. They've got to liaise with their program colleagues, with um, M&E specialists, um, and draw on the ICT expertise in-house and externally. Um, partnerships, partnerships with um, tech providers and partnerships with broadcast media um, are very important. Um, pilot projects are really important because they help test concepts, they help provide um, proof of concept and they inspire. Um, and finally, having monitoring and evaluation frameworks in place and it's just no excuse not to learn. 
um, you know, there's always there are plenty of excuses in emergencies. But you know, in the case of InfoAid, Aid, we weren't able to commission an independent evaluation um, and, and pay for it. And so we did a self-review. And yeah, it's not perfect, but at least you know, we've been able to learn and reflect and share um, what worked and what, most importantly, what didn't work and why. Um, so m and &E is absolutely mm -hmm. um, critical. Um, that's about it. Thank you.